Over at bangthebook.com, we are your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. Our writer is doing a phenomenal job on the daily with the NBA, college basketball, and NHL. Kyle Hunter, 6-0 and in his last six college picks, doing a great job with that daily piece. You certainly want to make sure you check that out, as well as Parker Michaels killing it in the NHL. Uh, we've got golf, NASCAR, UFC, tennis, lots of uh, all over at bangthebook.com as well. So please head on over there, check that out. And check out our Bang the Book YouTube page. I put up my Thursday three-pack video, my three favorite plays tonight in college basketball. Kyle Hunter has a video up for today's card, and he'll also have a video up for Saturday's card over there on that Bang the Book YouTube page as well. Finally, as you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio, presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook, BTB200 is that promo code, 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook, up to $500, 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino, up to $500 at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. One guest on the program here today, that is professional handicapper Brad Powers from bradpowersports.com. Brad, how's it going today, man? Brad, it's going well. How are you doing on this fine Thursday morning? Doing well, buddy. Appreciate your time as always here, man. And uh, signing day yesterday. You know, it's uh, it's obviously something that may not impact the 20 season too much. But I know we talked about it last week. You talked about the importance of following along with those recruiting rankings. Who were some of yesterday's big winners in terms of signing day? Well, first, let me say this. I I do think it's got more of an impact than than ever before as far as, you know, freshmen coming in and playing. Uh, Number one, you know, a lot of these players, I would say 25, 30% are already on campus. So they get to go through, you know, 15 spring practices. That's a jump. Uh, you know, a big jump start compared to where a lot of true freshmen were, say, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And, I mean, uh, in the last three national championship games, we've had a true freshman starting quarterback uh, in every one of those games, at least one of them. So I, I think recruiting is uh, more important than ever uh, just because, uh, you know, players can get, are, are more likely to play more. And, uh, yeah, obviously, if you get the right player in, it can be a nice uh, uh, stopgap for you. As far as, you know, the big winners from yesterday, you know, obviously Alabama at the top, that's not – I mean, if you're talking the greatest dynasty in sport, it's probably Alabama recruiting. Eight eight number one finishes in the last nine years. So, <laughs> nothing surprising. They're not surprising. Georgia comes in at number two. Georgia's probably been the second-best team as far as recruiting the last four years under Kirby Smart. Texas is a team that's going to get a lot of publicity um, the, the, this upcoming season because of what they did to Georgia in the bowl game because they returned their starting quarterback, Sam Ellinger. And also because each of the last two years, Texas has signed the number three recruiting class. So, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of positive vibes for Texas. But I'll caution, uh, when you look at experience returning, Texas is one of the bottom ten teams in the country. So uh, a little bit concerned there for the Longhorns moving forward. Some surprises, you know, A&M. And I'll just generally speak here. I think second-year coaches – are the ones that I was really looking at more than anything because it's their first full recruiting class. And we had a bunch of, you know, first year coaches last year at name brand programs, Jimbo Fisher being one of them. A&M just signed their best recruiting class this century, major positive up arrow for A&M. Uh, same goes for Florida Dan Mullen. They signed, they signed a, a top 10 class. So that, that's good for them. Mario Cristobal at Oregon signed their best class this century. I mean, that, that's his first full recruiting class. That's a major positive. Same with Scott Frost at Nebraska, a top 20 class from Nebraska's first top 20 class since 2005. The major negative for one of these second-year coaches, I think two of them, Willie Taggart, even though the Knowles finished number 16, uh, they, they, they failed to sign a quarterback again. That's two years in a row, and we just saw De, DeAndre Francois uh, basically kicked off the team. So Florida State's got some major, major issues at quarterback, negative for uh, Willie Taggart in his second year. And then I would say the biggest negative, biggest disappointment, Chip Kelly, UCLA. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Your first full recruiting class at UCLA and you signed the number 43 class in the country. That's coming off seven straight top 20 finishes for the Bruins. A uh, major loser yesterday was the UCLA Bruins. Well, and I think something else that's pretty important to point out about these recruiting rankings and, and the level of classes that these that these programs are pulling is that it kind of speaks to the health of the program. And that's sort of what you were talking about there 
with the second year head coaches, I mean, right now Florida State is, is not in good shape. I mean, they've got a lot of talent there, obviously, and you know, some significant holdover talent from Jimbo Fisher, but that's not a program in good health right now. And I think that may be, you know, more so than anything. I mean, you brought up some great points about, you know, the importance of freshmen here the last couple of years, but I think that may be more so than anything is kind of an illustrator to me and, and sort of a, you know, a finger in the right direction to me about how I want to start thinking about these teams because, you know, you've got a good coach or a, a program that largely sells itself and you're not pulling in good recruits. That's really concerning to me you know, over the long term here and also something where I, you know, I may look to fade some of those teams in the season win total market. No question about it. Uh, you know, and let's face it, 17 and 18 year old kids can be very impressionable. And if you have a, a tough time selling them, <laughs> I mean, how are you going to sell it to you? your donors and your fan base? Uh, and there's already a lot of negativity surrounding the program. Florida State being one, SC too. I mean, SC signed the number 18 class for most, you know, 90% of college football. I mean, anyone take number 18 recruiting class, but for SC, that's just not good enough uh, for Clay Helton. And then uh, obviously a lot of concerns there. So, you know, I know I get it that, that generally speaking, people all oh, recruiting doesn't matter. I think it does if you really follow it because it's kind of what, what's the trend line of this program? Uh, what's going to be the storylines in the off season? I mean, we got eight months to talk about it, and I mean, if there's some negative storylines out there as far as recruiting goes, uh, to me, and that carries over not only to recruiting for the next year, but can carry over to locker room a little bit. And, uh, yeah, more likely than not, I'm not going to blindly fade the teams that didn't recruit well uh, in, in the futures market and whatnot, but I can tell you this, I'd be more likely to play against teams like Florida State and SC, particularly, uh, you know, if they, they suffer a loss or two early in the season, uh, you know, that, that, I would pinpoint Florida State and SC as two teams that I wouldn't be shocked collapse down the stretch. Now, maybe this is something you haven't had a chance to look into yet, and I apologize for putting you on the spot if that's the case, but – we hit some power five teams there. Were there any group of five teams that, you know, really stood out either as a positive or a negative on signing day? I think Boise State was the biggest winner. I mean, when Boise State can finish in the top 50 in recruiting and, and beat 15, 20 schools when it comes to power five, beat teams like Northwestern, Georgia Tech, Syracuse, Wake Forest, Pittsburgh, uh, Arizona, Kevin Sumlin had a very disappointing uh, first full recruiting class at, at, at Arizona. I would say big winner would be Boise State. Uh, signed a really good, strong class coming out of there. And a couple of Florida schools also were very strong. UCF uh, continuing. And, and obviously when you have a 25-game win streak, when you're playing in back-to-back big bowl games, you know, not really surprising that UCF's one of the top group of five. And, and again, not a big surprise that, that out of the, you know, when you throw out the, you know, the Mountain West and also the American Athletic, you're talking the three smallest conferences, no big surprise that Lane Kiffin and Florida Atlantic signed a big class uh, and actually beat schools like Vanderbilt, Boston College, Maryland, Rutgers. I mean, for Florida Atlantic to sign the number 57 class in the country, that, that's relatively impressive. So that, that's not too bad there. I guess on the lower end, uh, you know, I'm going to throw one out there, Louisville. Uh, I know it's not a smaller conference, but Louisville signing the number 73 class. Might not hurt them this year, but that's one, two, three years from now, keeping your back pocket. Not going to be a lot of junior and senior and senior leadership from, from that class. Uh, I guess a team that, I mean, I'm not stunned because they have a new coach, but I, I do follow it because it's my alma mater. <laughs> but Bowling Green signed the number 129 class in the country. Uh, that, that's just not going to cut it there uh, in, in Northwest Ohio. So uh, they, I did follow that a little bit, and that was a disappointment, to, to say the least. That is a bummer. I mean, you know, you talk about Bowling Green, you talk about their location. You know, the, the Northwest schools up in the Toledo area do have some pretty decent high school football players. Same thing straight down 75 in Cincinnati. You would certainly hope that, you know, the MAC schools would, would get – this is – I don't mean this as a negative, but it's going to have a negative connotation to it – you would think they could get some of the scraps from Ohio high school football that you know the Big Ten doesn't get, but you know, it seems like Bowling Green definitely up against it a little <laughs> bit. And, and some of that, too. I mean, look, let's be honest. I mean, the athletic director Googling to find out you know, that he should hire Mike Jinks, I mean, the optics of that really weren't a good look. And not to say that that's the reason why they pulled a bad class, but you know, obviously there's a lot that goes into the recruiting process that you know, we hear about and then even more that we don't hear about. 
Yeah, and look, I mean, I would say outside of the Sun Belt states, uh, you know, California, Texas, and, and Florida, and I would say throw Georgia in there and Louisiana, Ohio is the best state when it comes to high school football, you know, at least pumping out uh, and not only college level recruits, but, 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 you know, they even higher when you get up to the NFL level and, you know, when your rival Toledo signs the number 71 class and, and you're, you know, 50, 60 spots behind them, uh, that just shows me what you could be capable of if you really, you know, <laughs> I would say put, put some effort into it. I, I mean, we've seen Bowling Green in the past be up there. There's just no excuse. Some of these max schools should definitely recruit a lot better than what they did. I mean, the state of Ohio is a very good, state it's been that way for 50 60 years pumping out high school players and uh if you're doing your homework you should definitely uh, be able to get some leftovers that, that ohio state didn't want and whatnot so uh yeah <laughs> it's, it's disappointing to say the least i mean hey at least you can take solace in the fact that bowling green's got a pretty good basketball team and a very very good hockey team that's true i, I didn't know the hockey team was pretty good this year but the, the basketball team has been very profitable uh, I've been following along off a big upset last week against uh, Buffalo and turned around and followed up with another one, one of the hottest teams in the country as far as ATUS-wise. So I have kept track of that. It's probably the first time in about 10 or 15 years since the Dan Dockage era there's been any kind of excitement there uh, c- c- coming out of uh, Bowling Green when it comes to hoops. Well, Bowling Green's 16th in the country in hockey, so maybe something that you do uh, oh, want wow. to pay attention to a little bit more. Yeah, right? See, I think you didn't go to many hockey games while you were on campus. No, I did not. I was uh, too busy uh, <laughs> up and down Main Street uh, attending some uh, extracurricular activities. There you go. Good for you. All right, man, let's talk some Big Ten college basketball here. And uh, I think the big question on everybody's mind right now is what is wrong with Michigan State? Yeah, I mean, that that, that is the lead storyline. And look, just I mean, if you asked me 10 days ago, nothing was wrong really with Michigan State. I mean, I can excuse the loss uh, against Purdue. Uh, I just thought that was a tough spot for Sparty. I mean, prior to that, Michigan State, what, rolled off like 12 straight wins. They were one of the hottest teams in the country, and not not only straight up, but also against the spread. But to follow that up with back-to-back losses as a double-digit favorite, first at home, no excuse uh, against Indiana, especially when college game days in town, uh, to, to lose that game in overtime. And then, you know, you, you think Sparty, and, and Sparty's been pretty good after back-to-back losses. Under Tom Izzo, that they're about sixty percent against the spread covering. The fact that they go, you know, to Illinois again as a double-digit favorite and lose that one. Langford's done for the season, but it's not like he just got hurt and, and has missed the last three games. I mean, they've been playing well without him prior. So, uh, I mean, there's always ebbs and flows to a college basketball season, and uh, I would, you know, remiss if I didn't say, you know, be careful on that. A lot of times I find value when those teams get on two, three-game losing streaks and start buying them. But uh, clearly, I I don't know if it ends anytime soon. I would like to give Tom Izzo the benefit of the doubt. But, uh, you know, I had Michigan State, like, number four in my power ratings. And and now they're getting to the point where uh, another loss or two, and they won't even be in my top ten. Now, Michigan State here in the last three games, those losses to Purdue, Indiana, and Illinois – 1.121 1.121 points per possession allowed to Purdue, 1.094 to Indiana, 1.118 to Illinois. So when you look at that, I mean, would you rather, you know, is it better in your mind to go back on a team that's struggling on offense or better to, in your mind to go back on a team that's struggling on defense? Which one do you think is easier to fix? <sighs> that's a very tough question. I would like that. I mean, Making shots for the most part, I mean, there's an element to luck to making shots. There just is. I mean, whether I mean, obviously you can be one of the top shooting teams in the country and vice versa, but, uh, I mean, sometimes you just have off nights. When you're playing 30-some games, you're going to have one game or two where you're just not hitting your shots. I mean, similar to, to football, you're going to have a game where you had four or five turnovers and you're not going to play your best. I think that's easier uh, to get back. Man, defense to me is more effort than anything. I mean, obviously, schematically, it plays a big part of it. But when it comes to these games in January and February, uh, before it really matters come March, a lot of defense, uh, as far as efficiency goes, is just effort-wise. And uh, it's a little concerning that that's the problem for Michigan State. Now, again, small sample size. I mean, it's a very concerning three games. And, I mean, Tom Izzo is more known for defensive 
uh, you know, defense and rebounding as far as his career. So I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, but uh, I think it's a lot easier to, to get back in, in the rhythm offensively if it just came down to you just had a couple bad games sh- shooting where defense, uh, it's a concern if it's effort. And maybe they're wearing down a little bit because they're a little depth shy. That that might be something to keep track of. But, uh, again, if Michigan State hadn't been so dominant prior to this three-game losing streak, I guess I'd be a little bit more concerned. Uh, we'll see in the next couple of games. I know they got Michigan coming up here soon, uh, within a week or two, and that, that'll be a good point as far as what the hierarchy is in some Big Ten. Yeah, I think it's one of those things, too, for Michigan State, one of the lowest turnover percentages in the country on defense. So, you know, if you are struggling on defense with rotations or, you know, you're just not communicating well, something like that, you get some of those turnovers. It kind of – not that I'm a huge believer in momentum or anything like that, but it can change the complexion of the game a little bit, and it can you know, give you a little bit of a respite if you're able to take the basketball away and not really have to bear down for the whole you know, 25, 30 seconds of a possession. Michigan State doesn't really have that luxury right now. Maybe that's something that's hurting them a little bit more. How about a team that is you know, pretty good on deep, very good on defense, pretty good on the offensive end of the floor, Michigan. That one-off loss at Iowa by 15 points, not a great look. Good bounce back effort against Rutgers. Is Michigan the top team in the Big Ten for you? Yeah, right now I would have said Michigan State a week ago, but uh, right now clearly it's Michigan, and uh, they got a big revenge game coming up here against Wisconsin, one of their other uh, losses of the season. You know, I can excuse the Iowa game. Iowa's pretty solid, so uh, you know, t- a tough road trip there, uh, and and obviously the other one being a road trip to, to Wisconsin, so. Uh, as far as punching holes in their game, but they're, they're look, they're not spectacular. They they don't have the the Zion Williamsons and the R.G. Barrett like a Duke does. But when it comes to tactically X's and O's, both offensively, that's beeline specialty. And then uh, I mean, we made one of the better defensive hires in the country last year. And really, Michigan's defense they've been known more for that year the last uh, year and a half or so when they made this run. I, I mean, there's not a lot of holes in Michigan's game and. Uh, right now, there's no question about it. Uh, I think they're the best team in the Big Ten, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they ha- have the highest upside. I still think if Michigan State gets their act together, Michigan State's got some upside, and uh, I think a true test will be, you know, coming up this weekend uh, on Saturday, hosting Wisconsin. I think Michigan re- be right around the, you know, probably a six-point favorite or so if they take care of business against a, a Wisconsin team that's been surging ever since they, they outright upset the Wolverines. I think that'd be a good sign. Uh, that, that Michigan really put that Iowa loss behind them. So hopefully our, our bang the book radio listeners jumped on the Purdue train because we talked about how good they've been playing offensively. We talked about how they were a better defensive team than they had shown. Now all of a sudden they're moving up the defensive ranks rather quickly. So is, is Purdue kind of in that number three slot for you? How close are they to overtaking Michigan state for number two? They're getting up there. Uh, again, Michigan, I mean, it's real close because right now I have Purdue power rate number 10 in the country. <laughs> That's pretty strong for a team uh, that has six losses. Uh, and obviously Purdue with, with seven straight wins and, and had six straight covers prior to, you know, they're starting to get a little expensive. Then the Minnesota game, they failed to cover by a bucket in their most recent game. Uh, but, yeah, I, I certainly have Purdue, and I think, uh, when you look at it, possibly after I, I update my power ratings every single Friday, it's going to be real tight between them and Michigan State. But, but looking at Purdue's schedule, I mean, I, I don't see a clear-cut loss really down the stretch of the season. Not saying that they're going to run the table here, but there's not going to be a single game where where Purdue isn't you know either favored or a very short underdog. Uh, so I, I I don't see any reason why. Purdue's run here doesn't continue so you know kudos for you guys jumping on that uh obviously you know the the big win against Michigan State really you know it got them going and then in a flat spot against Penn State they're up against it's overtime on the road they find a way to win and cover a lot to like about Purdue they're, they're right along with Nebraska I mean they're, they're, we're not talking just Big Ten but we're talking nationally to the the more upstart teams here in the last couple of weeks how about we touch on a team that I, I really haven't heard too many people talk about here lately, Maryland. I mean, you'll get Maryland in adjusted offensive and defensive efficiency over at Bart Torvik. They're top 30 in the country in both, and I feel like nobody talks about the Terrapins. 
Yeah, and, uh, and the Terps had a big win last night against a, a reeling Nebraska team. Uh, you know, Maryland was getting a lot of love, and then, you know, they lost to Michigan State, turned around lost to Illinois, uh, and then lost to Wisconsin. So, you know, recently, yeah, they, they've been playing maybe some of their worst basketball this season, so I get that they fell out of love a little bit in the marketplace. But, again, a very big road win last night. And, and you know, coming up here, they got about a week off, and then they host Purdue, which will be a really big game. I mean, I have Maryland power rated right around number 26 in the country, so I, I think easily, clearly above the cut line when it comes to making an NCAA tournament. But uh, a win against Purdue at home uh, would do wonders for them. They're going to need it because right after that, they're at Michigan and at Iowa. So a really tough stretch here for the Terps. But, uh, yeah, I, I like them. I mean, the, I think there's been some value on them. And, and, and Turgeon does a good job as far as the head coach goes. I mean, and they always seem to be in the mix. Now, you mentioned Maryland with uh, almost a week off here. They play six days after that Nebraska win last night. So they go from Wednesday to Tuesday. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of rhythm to the college basketball schedule. And one thing I did notice here about the Big Ten over the last couple of weeks, you know, they're playing some games on different nights. I know Maryland's played some Friday night games. You know, they've played Wednesday. They had a Thursday night game. Not Maryland, but there was a, a Thursday. There's a couple of Thursday night games, I think, here over the last couple of weeks. They're kind of moving this schedule around. Does, does that bother you where you've got teams that are maybe getting, you know, six, seven days off here and then have to shake off the rust and, you know, go play a big game? No. Uh, you know, I, I think actually the opposite. I, I think this time of year there's a grind, and if you listen to coaches, I mean, throughout the years, I mean, that, if you're going to need a week off, I think this is the, the time of year where you might need one. Now, And you know, if you're Kentucky – <laughs> and you won nine straight, and, and your freshmen and your young players are really starting to come together. A team like Kentucky, no, I wouldn't want a week off. But, you know, a lot of these teams, uh, I mean, let's face it, you're about halfway through your conference schedule. Uh, you, you got, what, a little a month left as far as the regular season to make that final push. I, I think, and more often than not, a week off this time of year can be do more positive than negative. But obviously, just like any other team or, or situation when you look at it, it's case by case basis but uh, out there you know broadening that topic a little bit I like it that these teams are playing you know on specific different days because a lot of times you can find some matchup edges where you got a team that's got you know three extra days rest compared to another and you know I, I don't think when you got 353 division one teams I don't think the marketplace always account and properly accounts that for uh, in the line. All right, so as we look up and down the Big Ten as a whole, we've got some elite-level teams. We've got some very, very good teams. We've got some very good teams, some good teams, and then some pretty good teams. I mean, there's no team in this conference that is absolutely terrible. I mean, even Rutgers, just outside the top 60 in defensive efficiency nationally here this year, they're not good offensively by any means, but still pretty good defensively. So what about the rest of the Big Ten here? Teams like Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, Penn State, Northwestern, Rutgers, anything, you know, are those teams, you know, spot play worthy? Anything you do like or dislike about them? Well, I mean, I'll give Penn State credit. I mean, I thought they were a dead cat. I mean, with their coach shoving a player suspended, they started off the Big Ten season 0-10, and they went on the road to Evanston and beat Northwestern outright earlier this week. And that was coming off of, you know, a high-level effort game against Purdue, well, where they nearly won that game at, at home and they ended up losing in overtime. So uh, I think your general point is right. There's not a lot of layups come Big Ten uh, this year. Rutgers is better than what they've been in the past. Illinois has been surging. Illinois is a team, you know, forget looking at the straight-up record. I mean, they played one of the more difficult schedules in the entire country, and that's seeming to pay off for them as they go down the stretch with so, several big wins. Uh, you know, if there's a team that that, that I would say – that that looks like, you know, I just mentioned Penn State looked like a dead cat. I think the dead cat right now in the conference, roadkill, is Nebraska. I mean, they lose Copeland. It's already a, a pretty depth-shy team already, really relies on their starters. They lost their second-leading uh, scorer in Copeland. And now it's a team that, that's now lost six straight games, failed to cover the spread in six straight. Their head coach, Miles, was already kind of on the hot seat. It was kind of NCAA tournament or bust. This year, they started the season Nebraska borderline top 10 team empowering. And that was kind of their high point at the end of December. And, and now it looks like all is lost for Nebraska. So if there's one team that I'm looking to fade right now in the conference, regardless of where they stack rank, 
I, I think Nebraska's in some big time trouble. And, and you know, a home game last night where they're about a you know a two three point favorite, and they get beat up pretty good against Maryland at Purdue on deck. That's not going to be easy. Uh, yeah, I think Nebraska is a team that that I would like to fade moving forward. All right, so with uh, with the late cancellation from Tony George and him him unable to join us, I do want to ask you some of the talking points I was going to ask him. Uh, one of them being, you know, you've got teams that are playing an opponent for a second time now in conference play. So you've got revenge factors, you've got a rematch factor. How do you handicap those? Uh, you got to be real careful. Uh, I mean, you're looking for outliers, but th- those are outliers might, you know, represent you know specific matchups uh, that a team might ha- have o- over another. So I-, I like to look a little bit, and I get it. There's turnover come college basketball more so than maybe maybe college football, but I, I like to look a lot more than one game. I, I mean, I get it. Revenge specifically. I, I mean, if you get upset. Uh, and, you know, big time. Obviously, the revenge factor is something that you got to consider. You know, when Duke plays Syracuse again, uh, that would be one that it, – but it's going to be priced from the marketplace more often than not. One that I do like is, you know, if you get, uh, you know, upset at home uh, and, and you go back on the road and, and maybe you're a short dog, you know, more pro- that, that's been a, a long-term, more profitable trend is playing on that team that was upset at home in the rematch. But but a lot of times be very careful because there might be specific matchup reasons for why that team got outright upset in, in that first meeting. So and maybe take a peek at what happened last year uh, with some of these teams, especially uh, and not necessarily the top ten teams in the country because uh, there's roster turnover there. But you know your mid level conferences a lot of the a lot of times you have the same players. So if there's a specific matchup reason why a team uh, is struggling. Uh, be very wary of that and not just blindly play on the, uh, these revenge factors and home and away. That's an excellent point because I think a lot of people just sort of look at it and say, oh, well, that team's going to get revenge. And, and, you know, especially if it's yeah. a, a name brand type of team. And like you said, maybe it's just a bad matchup thing. And this will come up again in conference tournaments when, you know, we hear everybody saying, oh, you, it's so hard to beat a team three times. Not if you're better than that team. Not if you match mm, up well against point. that team. Too many people take that for granted, I think, of, oh, well, they're going to get revenge. Maybe they just don't match up well. Yeah, and I'll give you a great example from this week, uh, and, and I fell prey to it. Uh, Marquette, 16-1 in their last 17 games. That one loss was against St. John's earlier this season. So I played into the uh, revenge factor. I thought it was a, de- you know, a decent number. Marquette was laying around 6.5. This is from the other night, and what happened? Marquette loses outright again at home. So you got a Marquette team that's 16-2 and two, straight up their last 18 games, and both straight-up losses come to St. John's. So uh, for whatever reason, and I haven't found anything too specific what St. John's does, but obviously I'm not going to be on the Marquette side if those two teams uh, meet up in, in as far as a Big East Conference tournament, and, and it's good possibility they will. And they're both probably in the top four of that conference. So, uh, I, I'm not going to blindly say, hey, Mark, I lost the first two. Uh, tough to beat a team three times in a season. No, I mean, to me, th- those two performances are such outliers that it, for whatever reason, St. John's is a bad matchup for Marquette. So I'm not going to fall prey to that a second time. You know what pisses me off is I actually looked at that game. And, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm going, okay, you know, they beat Marquette by 20 at home. You know, Marquette's probably got to be pissed off here in this game, and, and, you know, deservedly so. I mean, they certainly should be. And then I was looking at the schedule, and St. John's played Duke on on, on February 2nd. And then they go and play a former Duke assistant with Marquette the next game. And I thought, they've got the blueprint. You know, they already beat them by 20. They just – and they got blown out by Duke, of course, the game right before that. But, you know, I'm thinking to myself – I, I should I should do something with this. There's a play to be made here. I mean, this is a St. John's team that beat Duke last year on February 3rd. So maybe it's just this type of Duke scheme that they can play against. Keep that in mind, I guess, if these two teams run into each other in the Big East Conference tournament. Excellent point. And schematically, it can, it can make a difference in a lot of those. And, you know, another reason I played against St. John's, you know, I guess I should have dived deeper as far as the Duke angle, but I mean, St. John's is at Creighton, at at Marquette. I mean, for a team that's in the Northeast, that's a hell of a lot of travel, and that was just in a seven-day period. So that was another reason why I played against it. But obviously the matchup factor, for whatever reason, 
um, you know, overcame all those what I perceive to be uh, negative factors for St. John's. That's a good one. And, and I'm going to throw one more out, out there because we're talking matchups. You know, Washington's the team that's been surging in the Pac-12. I mean, they got a second-year coach that, that, that's, you know, from Syracuse that's doing that zone defense, and the Pac-12 is having some big-time problems adjusting that zone defense. They just hadn't seen it in the conference for, for such a long period. Uh, and we see it all the time why Syracuse is so good in March. Those teams aren't used to seeing a zone defense. Uh, those specific matchups are a lot of reasons why these teams go on runs. Yeah, and that's the thing, too. I mean, I think sometimes, you know, there are so many stats and so many efficiency metrics and things like that out there about college basketball now. But, you know, how many times do we talk about this in college football or in other sports? You know, an assistant or a coordinator goes to, you know, uh, another school and those two schools wind up playing or, you know, they play a team that played their previous employer the year before and had success with it. And we just we happen to overlook those things. You know, I, I don't know if it's just because, so many of us get so deep into the numbers or, you know, whatever the case may be, yeah. but man, there, there's, you know, and, and it's, it's tough too, because, you know, you look at it after the fact and say, well, shit, I should have saw that. I should have recognized that. I should have realized that it, there's information overload. I know it's something that you talk about all the time, you know, that uh, paralysis by over analysis thing. It's a real thing, man. It's a real thing. And you talk about 353 college basketball teams and, everyone trying to do college hoops. Now I, I implore our listeners to be very careful not to fall into that trap. Yeah, I agree. And again, specialization. I mean, if you really want to do it uh, and, and I, I guess the problem I run into, I do so much media, so much media that I have to, you know, focus in on five or six of the bigger conferences uh, and then talk about them. But really, ideally, if I was just betting for a living, uh, I mean, more often than not, I just focus in on a couple of smaller conferences just know the insides and the outs of that, and there's a good chance you can know the market better than most. Now, the issue would be, you know, can I get enough money off of uh, on some of those games? But, I mean, if you're just doing this as a hobby, and but you want to be successful, again, and you're doing it part-time, uh, you know, something, you know, as a hobby, and when you get home from work, just focus in on a conference or so, and, and just, you know, try not to overwhelm yourself trying try to know everything about all 353 teams. And it's a lot better to know a hell of a lot about 20 teams than it is a little about 350 teams. All right. So if we've ever talked NBA here on our segments, I can't remember doing it. So maybe this is a first for Bang the Book Radio. I'm not entirely sure. I guess maybe we probably talked some NBA playoffs at some point or, or something like that. Maybe talked about the Cavs and LeBron. I don't know. But speaking of LeBron, the Lakers tonight in Boston, the trade deadline today at 3 o'clock Eastern time. So a lot of moving parts. We've seen a lot of trades here already. I want to sort of lump together handicapping the trade deadline with that big marquee game here tonight between the Lakers and the Celtics. Well, I mean, I think we clearly saw it, you know, the effects of it the other night on Lakers. I mean, they were a favorite against the Pacers, and they were in a really good spot. The Lakers had multiple days rest. Uh, they needed to win if they had any hopes as far as the playoffs because of their upcoming schedule. Uh, especially you know tonight against Boston. I think they're on the road against Philly up next. Uh, they're playing a Pacers team that had played the, you know the three games in four nights. So Lakers are favored, and somehow they lose by 42 points. I mean, that's only happened as far as a favorite in the NBA lose by 40-plus points. It's only happened a total of 14 times in the last 24 years. That's, you know, once about every 2,200 games something like that happens and clearly uh, I guess the biggest takeaway would be you know how would you feel if you're a Kyle Kuzma or a Alonzo Ball or an Ingram and and, you know for the first time in your life you're pretty much told you're not wanted I mean you've been talked up your whole life preached about how you're the best in your AAU you're the best in high school whether whether you went to college or not but you're talked up now all of a sudden you're expendable for the first time in your life uh, that probably doesn't feel good for those young Lakers players, and, and clearly they proved it by a complete no-show the other night. So I think clearly distractions. Now, do I want to blindly play against the Lakers, uh, you know, all the time? No, but I definitely don't want to play on them with all these distractions going on right now. And right now the market says Boston, uh, at least the early money is coming in on the Celtics here after that dismal performance by L.A. the other night. So, you know, generally speaking, uh, these teams with a lot of question marks, 
uh, I think it's Fade City uh, come the NBA. And then even if trades happen, like, say, Philadelphia, and I know I'm going a little long-winded here as far as off-topic, but, it, you know, Philadelphia, at least for this season, it has a really good, strong starting five, but you know, don't automatically just start playing on them. Remember, it's going to take five to ten games of integration to get these players going. So after the trade deadline, I think a lot of teams that made big roster moves, you know, give them like five to ten games to get things going. I mean, keep in mind, the Miami Heat, when, when they got Bosh, Wade, and LeBron, were what, like nine and eight, their first 17 games? Uh, the, generally speaking, I, the teams that make big roster moves, either from distractions or integration, I want to fade more often than not. Well, and, and what's really interesting about that here this year is that you've got the trade deadline, and then in a week, the All-Star break starts. So you yep. play maybe two or three games to try and get that integration going and get some chemistry and get everybody to gel. And then all of a sudden you don't play with each other for five days or whatever the all-star break is. You know, guys go on vacation, spend time with their families. Some guys will be in Charlotte for the all-star game. You know, so even if there are practices or shoot arounds, not everybody's going to be there. You're going to be missing your most important players, the guys that have your highest usage rates and need to learn how to play with these new acquisitions. It's a very tough time of the year across the board in the NBA, but especially with teams in a state of flux, you know, like the Lakers. No, no question about it. And kudos to those guys that can figure out the motivation factors. I, I know you talk to a lot more people on a day-in and day-out basis that, that, that cover the NBA, and, and I tip the cap for those guys that can figure out properly and motivate these players because you can have some real easy winners if you handicap it correctly. Uh, in just my inner circle – I haven't found too many people that are having overwhelming success when it comes to handicapping in the NBA uh, this time of year. In fact, a lot of them are, are more cautious than not when it comes to releasing picks on a day-in and day-out basis. Brad Powers, professional handicapper over at bradpowersports.com. What's going on over there right now, man? Yeah, we talk about it each week. I mean, newsletter is still up there for 69 bucks. So next issue, uh, you can download all past issues for free if you want to check it out. 57% all-time winners. That's a, a 600-plus game sample size when it comes to college football and, and the NFL. And, and we'll have another one coming your way as far as the next newsletter up will be in March. But, I mean, right now, I guess, you know, if you're talking, you want to get on board with BP Sports right now, uh, we have a VIP package, the daily email updates as far as college basketball. You'll get one every single day through the national championship game in early April. It's $199 for those two months of college basketball VIP action, $199, and the newsletter is just $69. Check it out, bradpowersports.com. And as always, you can follow Brad on Twitter, at Brad Powers and the number seven. Brad, I know I kept you a little bit longer here today. Really appreciate the time and the flexibility. Thank you so much, brother, and we'll talk to you again next week. All right, take care, my friend.